Hello, everybody. Oh, big breath. This has been a bit of a rush for me. Um, can you guys let me know if you can hear me all right? Crowdcast is telling me I'm live, but I just, it's always nice to make sure. Um, if you guys haven't used Crowdcast before, I used it for the festival and really enjoyed it, which is why I'm back here using it again. And um, uh, there's a chat box on the right hand side of the screen. So if somebody can just do me a favor and yes, Priya says, yes, she can hear us. Good. I was just going to say, if somebody can do me a favor and let me know if they can hear me, that would be amazing. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. And um, so there's the chat box there on the right hand side of the screen. There's already so many lovely messages in there. So do say hello. Do uh, have a chat. Let us know where you're from. Um, and if you've got, you know, you can like make comments on the things as they're coming up. If you've got specific questions and I can see someone's already done it. Um, then if you click in the ask a question box um, that you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen, then I it just make sure that questions don't get lost um, in it. And we'll I'll try and circle back to them at the end. So don't feel like I'm ignoring you. If you've put a question in the ask a question box, I will try and circle back to them at the end. But I'll keep an eye on the chat as well. So any questions that um, that you have as we or you know anything that, that you want to comment on as we're going along do just do just pop in there this is being recorded so um the the replay is going to be up available for the next few days or for at least for the next week and i will send out a recording to everybody um who registered i think i can do that she says um so yeah let's kick off do you say hello loads of people saying hello in the chat do you say um let us know where you're from that'd be lovely to hear from if it's been chucking it down with rain <laughs> where you are i don't know if we've got any international um uh viewers today that would be really exciting um so yeah let us know in the chat um i am going to try and share my screen ontario canada whoa i always like it because then i'm like oh it's international uh, look my husband's just coming in with a cup of tea because it was all a bit of a rush thank you darling i did my usual thing of going yeah i'm gonna do i'm gonna do a workshop i'm gonna do an online workshop on i don't know tuesday or something um and on i'm gonna do it on thursday forgetting that you know the kids are home there's no time to do anything so um yeah Hence, I was literally putting this presentation together until about five to eight. Um, Nottingham, Canada, also Ontario, Canada. Uh, Nottingham, uh, Gloucestershire, been raining all day. I think somebody said sunny Scotland, so I'm a bit jealous about sunny Scotland. Hello from Hungary. Wow, hey, goodness me. Now, the reason behind kind of on Tuesday going, I'm going to run a workshop on fast fashion, is there were lots of pictures on Monday. Here in the UK, restrictions, lockdown restrictions eased another notch. Um, on Monday and the rallying cry that our, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson put out was shop for Britain, go out and shop for Britain, do your civic duty to keep the economy going uh, to, or to get the economy back up on its feet and apparently our value to the government is only as consumers and rather than as citizens um, and there were I guess the kind of expected pictures of people queuing up around the block to get into shopping centres to get into and and Primark seemed to hit a lot of the headlines and then there was this backlash from people saying um you know well a lot of people can only afford to shop in primark and i completely absolutely get that um but what i wanted to talk about was the fact that shopping or that fast fashion for some of us it's not a choice because we'll be on a really tight budget and there is a reason why we're shopping at these very <clears throat> or that you know that we're choosing um shops where clothes are very much cheaper for some of us fast fashion is still a choice but it's a choice we're not having to make financially and maybe it's a choice we're making because of um because we don't know um you know we, we've kind of vaguely heard of fast fashion we kind of know it's maybe bad but we don't really we don't we don't really know and you know surely they're all as bad as of each other and and I don't really understand who's not far, who's fast fashion and who is fast fashion and so I just wanted to come and to just put this little presentation together I don't have all the answers I am not a fast fashion expert um so you might be thinking well why the bloody hell am I spending an hour listening to you when you're not an expert but the I you know this is my whole thing I I don't consider myself an expert um in sustainability you know I've written a book I've just written my second book but the whole point is that we don't have to be experts to take action and to make a difference. So we can we can learn some new things and then we can make some different choices. And that's kind of the whole point. Um, 
So uh, this is a no, there is no judgment here today on this podcast, on this podcast, on this, on this webinar. Um, you know, if I didn't know these, these facts and figures until we spent a year buying nothing new. Um, let me just dive into my screen share because I'm aware that I'm um, diving into bits that I've got funky little slides for. Right. Can you guys see that? Let me know if you can see the pretty slides. Um, just give me a yes in the um, chat if you can see my pretty slides. Um, there should be a slide of a uh, yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Just a Z for your name, Z. I'm not sure why that is. Brilliant. Lots of people saying they can see it. Mel's looking forward to stocking book two in her bookshop. You're so sweet. Thank you very much. So we're going to talk today about how to take some of the fast out of fashion. So I'm not saying you can never go to Primark again. You can never go to H&M. Like, you know, that, that's... You know, this is all about the ish. I am, I am sustainable ish. So what's the high Zelda? Um, so we're all about sustainable ish. Um, so this is thinking about how we can make um, more informed decisions more of the time. Okay, so that's that's what we're kind of aiming for. Um, let's see if this works. Welcome. So here's a little rundown of what we're going to do. We're going to talk about what fast fashion is because, you know, some people are like, well, I don't, I don't know, you know, what is fast fashion? What's not fast fashion? Like I said, aren't they all as bad as each other? We're going to look at some of the impacts of the fast fashion industry. And we're going to talk about what happens to our clothes when we no longer want or need them. And then the really important bit is um, that we're going to look at different ways that we can still enjoy fashion, but in a more planet friendly way. And then we're going to pick some actions that we're going to take. If anyone has ever been to one of my talks, uh, anyone has been to a, a webinar or anything that I've done before, if anyone came to any of the festival sessions, you don't get away with just coming and, and um, sitting and having a nice hour. Um, you, you, there will be um, an invitation at the end that you take some action um, and that we actually get some real, real change coming out of this. Dears, don't worry about being late. Someone collecting plastic soap pumps. That's exciting. Um, so just quickly, for those of you who haven't met me, and I always feel a bit of a wanker saying about myself, but um, I am just an ordinary knackered mum of two. And we spent a year buying nothing new. Um, oh, it feels like way back when, 2012, 13. Um, the kids were two and four, something like that, really little. Um, and and I started this blog called My Make Do and Mend Year, all about to document that year. Ended up blogging every day, built up this, you know, got to know all these amazing people online, built up this um, community, and we've now got this amazing sustainable-ish online community of over forty thousand people, possibly nearly fifty thousand now, all taking imperfect eco action, and that is the important bit. It's the imperfect eco action. As a result of that year, I got some amazing opportunities. Got asked to do a TEDx talk. Um, have uh, you know written for national newspapers, done some TV and radio work, um, and then the little thing there you can see. Um, just this is my book. So this is the Sustainable Ish Living Guide, and it came out in um, January with Bloomsbury. Give me a little yes or a or a wave or something in the chat if you've got the book, if you've read it, if you like it. It would be lovely to hear. And as I said, book number two has literally just been sent off to the. Um, to my editor and uh, that will be out in March and that is all about sustainable-ish parenting. So that's just to kind of set the scene. I am not an expert, I am not um, an environmental scientist, I'm not you know like a fast fashion. Liz it's your bible, you're so lovely, thank you. Tamsin loves it, Mel loves it. Effie's got it on loan from the library, that was a genius time to take it out Effie because then you get it for months. Jenny loves it, Bee loves it, Alison's got it, oh you guys haven't read it but want to. Gemma um, hopefully once the library's open back up you can you can get it or you can get it online. Brilliant, thank you guys. Um, Mel says it sells well in her book, that is amazing in her in her shop, that amazing um, just for you guys who've joined late, it looks like you've already got the hang of the chat, but if you've got any specific questions that um, you don't want me to miss, pop them in the ask a question box and I will circle back to them. Shauna, um, my TEDx link, God, I'm kind of embarrassed to share it because it was um, right, I'd never done any public speaking before. It was my first public speaking gig. It was absolutely terrifying. Um, if you Google Jen Gale on um, YouTube, it's just because I can't do too many things at once, um, you should be able to find it. It was at TEDx Bedford. It was the, the event was called Everyday Radicals. Um, but I will, um, yeah, I can't do two things at once, but somebody might be able to find that for you. If not, you should be able to find it. But yeah, this is all to say, look, you know, I'm just like an ordinary knackered mum and 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 you don't have to be an expert in these things to take action there is no no wrong way to take action 
Um, so let's start, right, this is this is going to be really interesting because I tried to do some really whizzy, like snazzy whiz in things, had to ask my 11-year-old um, to help me, so let's see if it works. What is fast fashion? Hey, you're not even going to be able to read that, are you? Um, inexpensive clothing produced rapidly by mass market retailers in response to the latest trends. Oh, I had to really like get my specs out for that. Would it help if I made myself smaller? I don't know if I can do that. And then you guys might be able to, I say, would it help? I can't do it, so I won't do it. Um, let me see, there might be a way. Come on. wonder if it'll, oh, click to close message, let's do that. Now I've lost my PowerPoint. It's all just so smooth, isn't it, guys? Here we go. Focus screen, focus screen. Mm. Oh, there we go. That's worked, hasn't it? Right now, now I need to get my PowerPoint back up. Brilliant. Um, so that hopefully makes it a little bit clearer. But actually, I think it might just be a crap screenshot that's not very clear. Um, anyway, that's what fast fashion is. Not so long ago, fast fashion has only really been a thing for like the last twenty years. Um, <laughs> Fiona, hi Fiona. Found the chat via the app. Interesting. Um, hello from Stephen Langford. Hi, Fiona. Um, so uh, it's um, only really been, you know, I, I sort of think um, fast fashion has been around for ages, but actually it hasn't. And, um, you know, traditionally we'd have had these four seasons in a, um, sorry, Wendy. I'll, yeah, I'll, so we'll see how the rest of the slides go. Wendy's saying the writing's still small. Um, you know, not so long ago, there were four seasons in a year, fashion seasons, and, um, you know, the retailers would bring out spring, summer, autumn, winter, or spring, summer, autumn, winter collections. Um, and now there can be up to 52, like literally one a week. Um, and this this stuff is just churned out, churned out. Um, and um, it causes problems. Um, one, some of the problems that it causes are for the planet, right? This is where we're going to see if my um, my snazzy things work. In the last 15 years, clothing production has doubled. Um, so like I said, we I, I feel like I've grown up with fast fashion and that it's always been around. But actually, that's not the case. You know, even like in 2000s, it wasn't really as big as it was now. So in the last 15 years, clothing production has doubled. In the chat, if there's any of these that go, oh, make you go, oh, my God, just say. Globally, we consume 80 billion pieces of clothing every year. It's estimated that more than half of the fast fashion that's produced is disposed of in under a year. One bin lorry of clothing is landfilled or burned every single second around the world. Uh, buying just one cotton t-shirt or shirt produces the same emissions as driving a car for 35 miles. Um, it takes between 10 and 100% of the weight of a fabric in chemicals to produce that fabric. The fashion industry produces 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Now you compare that, you know, we would traditionally think of the aviation industry as being really, really polluting, and that's between two and 4%. So we're talking about fast fashion, 10%, you know, and this is, I think this is something that we can all just choose differently around. Um, the fashion industry is the second largest consumer of the world's water supply, responsible for 20% of all industrial water pollution worldwide. Now, the, the photo that you're seeing there is the Aral Sea in Uzbekistan. I don't know if anybody saw um, Stacey Dooley did a, um, a documentary last year or the year before um, called Fashion's Dirty Secrets. And it's not um, it's not on iPlayer anymore, but there are still a few clips on YouTube. Um, there's a variety of different sources, so I, I can reference them all for you. I haven't just made them up. Lots of them are from fashionrevolution.org. Um, some of them are from, oh, I can't remember where I got some from the other day. But yeah, they're all kind of, they are sadly proper stats. Um, so this is the, the Aral Sea in Uzbekistan. It used to be the fourth largest lake in the world. Um, and in the 60s, they started um, diverting or sort of draining it to irrigate. Um, and a lot of it was cotton to irrigate a lot of the, the land in Uzbekistan and, and um, to grow the cotton. Um, and that shows the extent to which it's shrunk. So this was the fourth largest lake and now it's just kind of basically pretty much disappeared. It's become this kind of desert because of the water needed to grow cotton. Cotton is a really, really thirsty um, plant. We think of it as a natural fiber, so we kind of think it's okay. Um, and the problem for people, um, garment workers typically earn between one and 3% of the retail price of clothing. And I, I think I did write in the book, it basically means they're getting like 24p or between 8 and 24p for a typical garment. Um, uh, 
if you've got beading and sequins, this is something I read in um, Lucy Siegel's got a book called To Die For, all about fast fashion, which is really good. Um, and beading and sequins, she says in there, can often be an indication of child labour because uh, they've got nimbler fingers, littler fingers. Um, and you think how fashionable sequins are at the moment and how many of how many kids have those tops with those sequins that you brush and they go the other way. Like it just horrifies me to think that somebody else's child might have had to make that. Over 90% of garment workers um, globally have no possibility to negotiate their wages or conditions. So they're not allowed to kind of unionize and, and to demand for better wages. 70% uh, of UK, UK retailers, this one is from um, Fashion Revolution, 70% um, of UK retailers believe there is a likelihood of modern slavery in their supply chains. And the reason that they don't know is that they can come up with these really um, sort of these policies that look really, really um, uh good on paper or on a website but the problem is um that so much of the supply chain is outsourced and um you know they can sort of have a contract with one person and bits of it get outsourced along and along and along so they can't really know whether there's child labor whether there's um you know modern slavery whether there's the conditions that they're the people making their clothes are, are working in because it is all so complex and um, the book is called to die for um, it's by Lucy Siegel. It's quite a few years old now. I'm just reaching for it, sorry. Um, it's quite a few years old now, if you guys can see that. Um, but Lucy's a, a, an environmental, well, she's, she's a journalist and a presenter. And um, But it's like, you can tell she's a journalist. It's so robustly kind of researched and, and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, you know, this is the really tragic stuff. And that picture is um, Rana Plaza. When I was doing the year buying nothing new in, um, in 2013, there was the Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh, which lots of you might remember. Um, and, and it really kind of brought the whole issue of fast fashion to the fore. Um, it, I, I remember, you know, and I remember having conversations with people about it and them saying, um, yeah, you know, she was like, oh, I'm off to, off to Prime Arnie to buy something. And I was like, the, a factory's just collapsed and killed over a thousand people and she was like well they're all the same they're all as bad as each other aren't they do you know um but do you know it kind of breaks my heart that that we somehow seem to think that our um our desire for a cheap t-shirt or a, a new outfit for the summer is more important than these people being able to work in safe conditions and I know it's not always that black and white I know it's not always that simple I know we can't always make the best decision um, for financial reasons or whatever um, but let's just li be a little bit more aware of, of what we're saying um, globally, again, I think this was from um, Fashion Revolution, nearly one in three female garment workers experience sexual harassment in the workplace. This is not a nice place to work. And I hear a lot of people say, well, do you know, surely the fact that these people have a job is a good is good. And if we and if we um, if we stop buying fast fashion, then um, these people won't have a job. But actually being a pay them, paying them a living wage, most of them are paid far below the living wage for their country. Paying them a living wage would only result in a two to seven percent increase for us as consumers. And I think the vast majority of us would be absolutely more than happy to pay that if we knew that that was what it was being, um, you know, it wasn't just then um, going to it. That is a great question, Caroline. We'll try and come to that. Is bamboo any better than cotton? Pop it in the ask a question box, Caroline, so I don't forget it. Um, and the problem, there's a problem with plastics as well, because 60% of our garments are now made from polyester. And this has doubled since 2000. I was surprised it was only 60% actually. If you think of the amount of, you know, I've got loads of synthetic fabrics in my wardrobe, mostly bought from the charity shop, but you know, there's loads of synthetics in there. Um, producing oil-based fibers for textiles uses 342 million barrels of oil a year. Like, and this oil needs to stay in the ground. If we are to stand any chance of, um, you know, keeping global warming um, temperatures below one and a half degrees, the oil needs to stay in the ground, whatever we're using it for. And when we wash these clothes with synthetic fabrics, um, synthetic fabrics, um, up to 700,000, I think that the figures really vary and some people are saying like millions, but basically fibers can be shared from our garments during a washing cycle. And when we're washing synthetic clothes, those, those fibers that are shared are um, little microplastics and they end up forming this kind of um, microplastic uh, soup in the ocean. And we're only just, it's only in the past few years that we've really started to realize what a problem this is. So things like fleeces, which were always sold as a really eco-friendly solution, 
um, you know, because they can be made from recycled plastic bottles and things are actually one of the worst things for shedding. Um, so we'll talk a little bit in a minute about sort of, um, you know, looking after our clothes and things. But one of the things that we can do is actually to wash our clothes less, which I'm like, woohoo, any excuse to do a bit less laundry. But, you know, if you've got things like fleeces, um, just sponge them off if they get dirty. And then, you know, if you can wash your fleece um, once a month instead of once a week, that's making a really big difference. Um, there is a bag called the Guppy Friend. I should have brought it in to be able to show you guys. I'll type it into the chat. Um, that looks a bit like a um, a big pillowcase, and you put your synthetic stuff in there, and it in it um, collects. I don't think it collects all of them, but it collects some of those microfibers, and it um, and then you can um, just pop them in your landfill bin where they will where they will stay safe um, and sort of out of the water course. Um, Carol's made a really good point. People have forgotten to pay the right price for goods, whether it's food or clothes. Yeah. And and there's a, a movie called The True Cost, which if you haven't watched it, is a really good um, sort of introduction to lots of these things. Um, and it talks about, you know, the fact that we've forgotten the true cost of these products and exactly the same way as we have with food as well. Um, come on. Doesn't want to play anymore. There we go. So what's the solution? Well, one, I don't know what all the solutions are, but I know that one part of the solution is us. It's you and me. It's the choices we make. It's where we choose to buy our clothes from. It's how we choose to treat our clothes. It's how long we keep our clothes in use. Um, so, yeah, if you're saying the WI have a, have a campaign going that launched in 2018, all about microfibers. There's loads of information on there. Excuse me while I take a slug of um, tea. Just pop in the comments if you're a tea or coffee person. I always like that. It always causes a bit of a debate. I'm totally tea or teen tea all the way. Um, so this is one of my favourite things. If you've read my book, probably if you've come to any of my talks, I very nearly always reference this wonderful hierarchy of needs, Effie's Coffee, uh, um, which is by um, a wonderful, wonderful woman called Sarah Lazarovich. I've got an interview with her on my podcast, Gin. <laughs> Good one, Diz. Um, uh, on my podcast and um, she is just absolutely phenomenal and she's a graphic um, a, a graphic designer and she's an environmentalist she does all these amazing things but this is kind of her um, her take on if you like a, a, a Maslow's hierarchy of needs if any of you've seen that and I just love it I just think if I was ever brave enough to get a tattoo I would have this tattooed on my head um, I know somebody um, who read the book and then and then drew this out and and um, pinned it to the fridge so that when their kids went, mummy, I need or I want, she'd go, oh, hold on a minute. Let's just have a little look at the hierarchy and work out, you know, how we might be able to get that. And if we do need to buy it new and all those sorts of things. So um, it is absolutely wonderful thing. So, do you know, like print it out and keep a copy of it in your purse or your wallet or whatever. But I just think it's wonderful. So the idea, obviously, is that you start at the bottom with use what you have and you're working your way up to the top. And it's just so beautiful. Um, in, this, in that um carol works in waste and we're definitely part of the bottom definitely on the bottom part of the hierarchy of waste so yeah when um there's a there's a hierarchy of waste as well which um and, and at the bottom you've got like refuse reduce reuse um before we get to kind of um recycling and rotting so um yeah i'm loving all the tea coffee chat um peroni well done <laughs> team tea missing a local um a, a cappuccino for the local um coffee shop definitely right um so if we start at the bottom we're just going to kind of whiz through that and hopefully maybe just spark off some ideas come up with some um some solutions that we can do ourselves and um, so using what you already have um these stats i came across when i was researching the book the average um british woman hoards 285 pounds worth of clothes that she will never wear can i move my mouse sorry is that better um, we wear just 20% of our clothes 80% of the time. You know, there's that 80-20 rule in lots of things, aren't there? Um, if we extend the, the active life of our clothes, so if we keep them in use for just nine months longer, we can reduce their carbon dioxide, water and waste footprints by 20 to 30%. Like, do you know, like this is, this is we're talking a lot of, uh, a lot of impact just by keeping the clothes we've already got in use. Um, so a, a few things just to think about is to do a wardrobe audit. I'm um, currently running a, um, we're uh, partway through or one week four of my six weeks um, to Sustainable-ish um, course. And um, a few of the, the, the amazing women in there have been doing um, wardrobe audits. And it's and it is a real eye opener. I, I did it as well. 
um, you know, you basically kind of get all your clothes, all your clothes out um, and uh, dump them on the bed and just kind of go through it um have a have a look at what you've got and i think you will be surprised because i don't know about you but you know i do there's that typical isn't there you open the wardrobe oh god i've got nothing to wear um and and actually you have it's just that um it's you're just pulling out the same clothes all the time so um so you know do that have a little look in your wardrobe make some piles have a pile of like visa keepers i absolutely love this i wear this all the time um but you know the whole Marie Kondo thing of like, does this spark joy? And I and I I kind of get it. Like, and especially with clothes, like you want to wear clothes that make you feel amazing. Um, there is a very small percentage of my wardrobe that makes me feel amazing. Um, so you know, like not everything is going to spark joy. Like you know, the the pants that you've been wearing for the last three years aren't going to spark joy but there is probably nothing wrong with them so you can keep on wearing them um you know we will all have stuff that um doesn't really make us as look amazing or whatever but we just like to snuggle up with it or whatever somebody else was doing um uh was was doing a wardrobe audit in on my course and she said um or she was looking at her wardrobe and she was like but each of those lots of those garments have have um mean something to me they're important to me and that's absolutely fine so i'm not saying get rid of all your clothes and have this real pared down minimalist wardrobe but just be really conscious of what you've got in your wardrobe and of whether you wear that whether it means anything to you actually whether it makes you feel a bit crap because you bought it thinking that you were going to lose weight and then you didn't do you know so there's lots of reasons why we've got clothes in our wardrobe um and and we aren't wearing them so have a little look and be you know be really quite ruthless one thing you can do is um and I've done this is to if there's something I'm not quite sure about, then I'll put it in um, you know, like under the bed or in in a um, in another bag or something like that. And if I, you know, if I don't still want it in three months, six months time, then I can think about what what I'm then going to do with it. Um, somebody um, posted a link in the chat to um, Project Three 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 by. I always get this wrong. It is Courtney Carver, isn't it? Because I always worry that I'm going to mix her up with the lady who plays Monaco out of friends but I think she's Courtney Carver she does this project that so 33 items in three months and um, that you just you just pick 33 items for three months and lots of people find that a really useful way of, of kind of keeping on top of their clothes I've got to move the mouse again sorry um so do that wardrobe audit make sure that you know you've really got the thing the clothes that you really like that you maybe you've got a pile of things that you don't like and a pile of things that maybe need mending um and and have a look about whether you can mend your things if you can't mend your things there is loads of help available at the moment and um, there's lots of help available online um the guys um we had um uh, a couple of brilliant ladies in from fast fashion therapy during the festival and they did a darning um workshop which did a sort of live darning and showed how to patch jeans when they go at the crotch and um, so that can be really useful um if anybody wants to go back and watch that and um, they're also doing like heart you can book a half hour slot with them online so that they can um you know if you've got something that you're not quite sure how to mend they can talk you through it so they're at fast fashion therapy um, but there are lots and lots of online resources available at the moment and um, when we're not in lockdown there's brilliant things like repair cafes where they will have volunteer menders on hand to repair things for you or to show you how to mend your things lots and lots of mending workshops um Another person from the festival um, is Erin Lewis Fitzgerald, who um, has a website called Modern Mending. She's in Australia, but she's just started doing her online mend her, her mending course online. Um, so, do you know, loads of ways if you sort of think, oh God, like who mends their clothes anymore? People really do. They really are starting to do that more and more now. Um, so, um, so yeah, right, oh my goodness, looks yeah. This um put your hanger, Claire says, put your hanger the wrong way round. So to go into your wardrobe, put all your clothes with the hangers way facing one way round one way round when you wear something turn it around the other way and that gives you a really good indicator of the stuff that you're the stuff that you're wearing and the stuff that you're not so that can be really good as well um Alessia does um came on the festival uh, just seen her in the chat hi Alessia she um does some amazing upcycles and things that she demoed for us um she's saying can you go 200 days without buying new and what what I'm going to encourage you all to do at the end is to to make a kind of pledge and uh, something that you're going to do out of the end of it um mended three skirts today well done two were dresses i didn't wear and transformed into new skirts great tip about the hangers yes nicola we're going to talk about swishing as well and um, so wash them well there's a website called love your clothes um i think it's loveyourclothes.com or .co.uk there's loads of tips on there for how to keep your clothes in use for longer um so do you know um hanging your clothes up um 
after you use them. I'm the world's worst person for this. I have like the world's biggest chair drobe. Hanging your clothes up after you use them. Um, um, you know, washing, following the proper washing instructions, washing at 30, um, mending things when they start to go, all those sorts of things. Um, love your clothes from wrap. Yeah, I think it's .co.uk, Carol. If you could let us know, that would be amazing. So, the you know, this whole... Um, thing about um, ethical fashion being more in, more um, more expensive, um, about living sustainably being more expensive. The most sustainable version of anything, the most sustainable clothes you can find are the ones that you already have. Do you know, like I, I just keep want to keep drumming that home to people that we don't need to rush out and replace all our wardrobe with ethical, um, ethical clothes. We need to kind of use what we have and keep it in use for longer. Stella McCartney brushes her clothes. I don't even brush my kids' hair, Helen. I'm not going <laughs> to <laughs> not going to start brushing my clothes <laughs> but you can get those um if you've got a, uh, um, a safety razor you can use those to shave the bobbles off your um things like I'm rubbing that because I've got garments um bobbles on my things and um, you can use you can get these little clothes combs that do exactly the same thing as well so um yeah loads of things right uh borrow and swap so I'm gonna whiz through them God, I'm really overheating probably because I'm talking too much um borrow and swap um, uh, and next up on the hierarchy. And obviously in ordinary times, um, this would be much easier. So um, she brushes them instead of washing. Okay. Um, and the other thing you can do, sorry, I'll, um, just to jump back to the whole brushing your clothes, but do you know, sometimes your clothes just need an air. They don't need washing. I'd certainly with the boys falling into this habit of just scooping everything up off the floor and just chucking it all in the, in the washing machine because it was almost easier than trying to sort out what was clean and what was dirty. But a lot of the time, you know, and I will do this with the kids' school uniform. If they've got muddy trousers, I'll just like give it a scrub with a sponge and leave it to dry overnight or I'll either, either that or I'll be doing it in the morning with, and then drying it with the hairdryer before they go. But lots of times our clothes just need a good airing and they're not actually dirty. Um, so yeah, borrow and swap. Um, ordinarily, this would be much easier. Helen's just saying um, in uh, Devon, there are clothes swap kits you can borrow to host an event. Devon seemed to be really on it in terms of reuse and things, probably largely because of people like Helen. Um, so uh, what about smelly boys? <laughs> We're just reaching that stage, Alexandra. Um, so yeah, I do do the old sniff test and then it has to go. <laughs> And it has to go and be washed if it's smelly. Um, uh, so um, borrowing and swapping, we can think about things. Somebody's already mentioned um, swishing and clothes swaps. So swishing is just a fancy name for clothes swaps parties. And they can be um, as um, elaborate or as simple as you want them to be. So um, you can just when restrictions ease, um, you know, you can get you and your mates around on a Friday night with a bottle of wine and you can each bring along the things from your wardrobe that you no longer like. Freezing jeans to smoke, to kill smelly bacteria. That's a really good one. I like that. Um, and isn't it, the, didn't the, the, the CEO of Levi said he'd never washed his jeans or something? I'm sure he did. And he just freezes them. Um, right. <laughs> I keep getting distracted by the chat. I'm loving all the chat. Um, so you could just get your mates around. If you're going to do that, then um, make sure they're all a similar size to you. And if there's somebody whose clothes you really, really like, invite them. Because, you know, hopefully, you know, you might get some of their lovely clothes. Um, so you can do that or there will be more formal. You can, you know, there can be really elaborate um, uh, clothes swap events where you have all different tokens for different qualities of clothing and all those sorts of things. Um, but um, it's really it is quite easy to organise. Um, Helen said, you know, in Devon, they have these kits to, to hire out. I've done them in my town and, and you know, spoken to a local pub. They've let us use the Skittle Alley for free because they're getting people coming in and buying drinks. Um, and you just I mean, I just got people to bring in clothes as as they on the night, but you can get them to bring them sooner. You just need some clothes rails, which you might be able to find on FreeCycle or FreeGoal or ask people um, if anyone's got one you can borrow. You need a mirror. You need somewhere for people to try stuff on. But that can just be a cordoned off corner of a room. Um, and, and that can be a really lovely social event. And the brilliant thing I really love about it is that I think people come along to it who wouldn't necessarily come to a green event. They wouldn't come to a an eco event, but they will come to a clothes swap because a they're saving themselves some money. And it's a, just a really nice social. They come along with friends. They have a few drinks, all those kinds of things. Um, as I'm just saying, there must be a way to undertake a virtual swish or clothes swap. Somebody did this. Somebody in Nottingham. 
big swap events, I think. She did it on Instagram. Um, so that might be worth having a look and seeing if it's something that can be replicated. I think I think it's big swap events on Instagram in Nottingham. Sorry, another swig of tea. Um, so yeah, so that's certainly something to think about um, when lockdown ends. And obviously, um, you know, borrowing. So certainly in terms of, um, you know, going to a wedding or having a posh event to go to, we don't need to just buy to buy an outfit for that one occasion. If it's something we know we're only going to really wear once, can we rent it? You know, can we rent it from a clothes rental shop? Um, can we, um, um, certainly in terms of kids' clothes, um, there's um, a couple of new services, one called the Little Loop Clothing, one called Pure Bun, um, the Little Loop and Graceful Changes, I think, are two that do clothes rental for kids. So the idea is you play a monthly subscription and you get these bundle of clothes um, and then when the kids grow out of them you can um, send them back and you get the next bundle size up of clothes so especially for kids that are growing really really quickly something like that is amazing um so th and there's another website um another service and again um sally came on the on the festival called pure bundle and what she does is she kind of curates these bundles of secondhand clothes um like to a particular theme or do you know so that they have this this particular aesthetic and look and there'll be a particular size for children's clothes and and you can sort of order this bundle and I'm like oh my god I so need somebody to do that for grown-ups because I have no sense of style or how to put things together and um, so that kind of thing um, I would absolutely adore now thrifting um it's, you know it says thrift in the hierarchy um basically shopping second hand um some really yeah like a stylist for kids I know but Effie I want one for me <laughs> um only 10 to, this is a really shocking stat, only 10 to 30% of the clothes donated to charity in the UK are actually sold in the UK. And the secondhand textile trade is worth billions. Um, so, so there is this um, trade that is just crisscrossing the globe, worth billions and billions of dollars. There's an absolutely amazing post on, if anybody follows Dennis the Dust Cart, go and follow them on Facebook, they're amazing. And they've just put this brilliant post up about, um, about exactly this, about the textile trade and how the kind of bottom's fallen out of it. And there is no when um, at the moment for, for you know, the charity shops have kind of closed, so it's all really difficult. But um, the, the problem is that when we donate our clothes to charity shops, like I said, only 10 to 30% are, are sold within the charity shops. Um, the rest gets sold to the rag man and um, gets bundled up into these massive, um, um, uh, sort of a crate I can't remember what they're called but these big piles of clothes um, and they get shipped abroad and and they get shipped to to developing nations and there was an argument that you know well um there was this kind of two-pronged argument on the one hand uh, there was a worry that it was killing off the the tailoring industries in these in these um countries and on the other hand it was providing a lot of jobs for people sorting these clothes out and then selling them on there was a report in, um, and that's where this picture is from, um, on ITV, I think it was the end of last year, um, but that where they looked into this. And in the same way that we discovered in sort of 2018 that um, China and places like that weren't able to recycle the volume of plastic that they were getting from us, and they put a ban on it, um, the same thing is now happening with clothes. And they are so overwhelmed with the volume of clothes that they are they are that is being shipped over there, that there is no market for it anymore. There is nowhere for it to go. And it is literally sitting in these piles and rotting in it. Um, and there's a video, I think if you if you Google something like, um, I don't know, secondhand textiles, ITV or something like that, you'll probably be able to find the video. And it is a real eye opener that the, the reporters just stood there next to this pile of rotten clothes. Um, so do you know what I, so I'm not saying don't give your clothes to charity shops. I'm not saying, um, but what I'm saying is that um, we can't use charity shops as this kind of panacea for a, for our overconsumption. We can't continue piling things in at this end and expecting it all to just kind of go somewhere and for it to be OK. And because with a lot of fast fashion, it's produced so cheaply, um, you know, the materials are really poor quality and um, the sewing is often quite poor quality that these things just aren't made to last. And so they have they can't be resold on. They just look, you know, that, that there is no market for them. And so we need to be really careful about that. Um, the um, Yeah, as somebody saying about the pricing in charity shops is that that sometimes there's a you know that they they maybe the people pricing aren't quite in touch with the prices of um some of the fast fashion um retailers so that actually sometimes it ends up being more expensive in the charity shop um so 
so yeah so we you know we really need to to try and slow down um at the kind of going in rate at the buying rate so that we're not there's not so much coming out the other end so obviously and and we get this um we have a second hand uniform service at school when when it's up and running um and loads and loads of parents are really happy to donate you know especially the branded school stuff when kids have outgrown it to the to the second hand service the pta sell it it makes a profit um you know makes some money for the school and um, loads of people are happy to donate very very few people actually buy from it and I saw somebody in there saying about this stigma around charity shop shopping and things like that. And I think, you know, um, I'm guessing if you're on this call, you know, you're probably already reasonably engaged with stuff and 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 you're probably quite happy to um, shop in charity shops and things like that. But I think there is still this stigma for some people. And I think perversely, there is still a stigma for maybe the people who can't. Um, you know, the people who are shopping in Primark and places like that for financial reasons, there maybe is this stigma that they don't want to be seen to be buying from charity shops because then their friends will think that they they haven't got money and they can't afford to buy new things. And um, so there's this kind of status symbol as well around it. Um, um, so, yeah, absolutely, you know, please, if you're if you're willing to donate stuff to charity shops, I think you need to be willing to buy it back from them as well. Um, so, um why buy when you can swap? And um, Claire, um, Claire has a um, a new project, a new website called Kid. Um, type it in the chat, Claire. Kid Three R, um, which is all about reusing kid stuff, which is amazing. Um, don't tell everyone, please, Jen. Charity shops are a treasure trove. Yeah, if you you know if you're um, and I love charity shop shopping, and obviously, and I never did before um, we spent our year buying nothing new. I just found it too messy to I could never find anything um I didn't want um, you know I could never find anything I wanted um but actually it, I think it is just a case of persevering and keeping going back and that sort of thing um but you can find lots of really great stuff in charity shops you just have to be a bit patient you know like if, if you're like I've, I'm constantly on the lookout for jeans um and it, you know finding that perfect pair of jeans is really hard is hard enough when you're buying new but um when you're buying secondhand it's even harder so I'm constantly on the lookout but it is just about um keeping going back and and obviously that that there's a certain privilege there in terms of need of having the time to be able to do that. So, you know, if you don't have the time to be trawling charity shops and things like that, then um, have a look on, um, you know, eBay, pre-loved. If you're looking for particular brands that you like, um, that, that can be really easy because you can just type that brand in. Make sure you tick the used box on there and, um, you know, and you can have a look. You can filter it by size, all those kinds of things. Um, there's, there's, if people know about Freegal and FreeCycle, I hope you do. They had stopped taking, um, sort of letting people list their stuff. So they're free um, sites that you can use where your local community can basically keep resources within use in the local community by passing stuff on between them. Um, they stopped um, people freegaling during um, at the peak of the coronavirus crisis, but I, I'm, I think they are back on that now. So you can, you know, go and check out your local Freegal group and hopefully find some things on there. Um, for people much cooler than me, um, there are websites, um, a couple of websites there, Depop and Vinted. Depop, um, I remember asking someone to explain it to me when I was writing the book about, you know, well, what is Depop? And they said, oh, it's uh, it's got a UI similar to Instagram. Blah, blah, blah. It looks like Instagram with the squares, but basically everything on there, you know, it's pictures of people showcasing their, their stuff to sell it. Brilliant. People saying Freegal is back on. Freegal groups are brilliant. Open. Well done. So, yeah, have a think about, you know, um, how you can find the things that you want secondhand. Um, and there are lots and lots of ways of doing it. Like I said, you might just need to pop your your patient pants on a bit or to sort of look a little bit outside the box or that kind of thing. And obviously vintage, you know, like vintage is secondhand. It's just got a different name um, and it's cooler. Um, make, I'm just going to really briefly touch on, although lots of people might have had a bit more time for making during lockdown. If you're making your own clothes, one advantage is that you are, you know, you can be pretty sure it's not being made in a sweatshop because hopefully you're taking regular tea break, yeah, regular loo breaks and, you know, you're having plenty of cups of tea and biscuits. Um, what you can't be sure of is whether the raw materials that you're using have been um, sort of made exploiting either people or planet. Um, so, um, you know, just think about, I think um, very often, when we're making things and especially you know it can get a bit addictive kind of and we kind of have all these projects on the go and that sort of thing and but we forget that you know that acrylic yarn is made from oil 
Um, and when we wash um, acrylic products, acrylic yarn and things, it will shed these microfibers. Um, uh, cotton, as I said, is, is a massively um, water and pesticide hungry fabric. Um, actually, one of the stats I meant to share with you, share with you earlier that um, farmer suicides in India, um, I can't remember what the, I should have written this down, um, but there are 250,000 farmer suicides in India, that might be annually, I need to check that stat, um, because they can't make ends meet, because the, um, the you know, the, the, the prices that people pay, are, well, that, that, that retailers and things are willing to pay is so low that they just can't make ends meet. And um, so, you know, it is a really serious kind of um, problem, social and environmental problem. Times in the website that I've put there up there is um, Offset Warehouse. They, and I've spelt it, look, I've spelt the link wrong. Um, so it's offsetwarehouse.com, not warehow. Um, Charlie, who runs it, is absolutely amazing. I love her. So everything's ethically produced. Uh, you know, she will go out and visit the weavers and the people making these things. Um, the, they, they do have a range of haberdashery on there. So they have, you know, they, I think they will have threads and things like that. If anybody's got, I did have a list and I can't, I, I can't remember where it is, but if anybody's got a list of, of uh, or some, some other links for places where they buy eco-friendly um, fabric and um, haberdashery and all that sort of thing. Um, but obviously, you know, look secondhand. There's quite a few comments on here, people saying, you know, old duvet covers. Like, I love old duvet covers because you can get some really lovely, like, retro prints. You get such a massive amount of fabric for, for um, you know, really um, very little money. Um, so that kind of thing can be really helpful. Um, so, yeah, just, just I'm not, you know, uh, wait, making things is a wonderful, and especially making your own clothes because it really makes you realize how much work goes into a, into an item of clothing. And, you know, I can guarantee you that you're not going to ditch that next time you have a bit of a clear out. Um, so uh, this is emptying the, the airing cupboard out of, to make scrub bags and stuff. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah, that's just a quick word on making. And then buying. Um, I said at the very beginning, you know, it's, it's really difficult. I think one of the things that, that keeps people going back to fast fashion companies is that, that it's, there's such a lack of transparency. It's really hard to know um, whether people are doing what they're saying they're doing, how much of it is greenwashing, how much of it, you know, like H&M and Primark, I think they've all got these, um, I think they've all got these, um, just looking at the chat, I'm like sexists, sewists, sewists. Um, they've all got these um, sort of, um, eco-friendly ranges and things like that. So it's really difficult to know um, whether you're being greenwashed, so whether they're telling you stuff that you wanna hear but isn't actually that true. Um, so there's an app called Good On You, which is a free app, and that allows you to, um, to put in a brand. So you could put in Marks and Spencers, you could put in H&M, you could put in Primark, and it will give it a rating based on the, the information that they have that's available to them. Um, so that's a really good one, you know, especially if you're looking for high street brands and things like that. Um, what it will also do, which I really like and which we'll talk a little bit about in a minute, and the activism is, if, if you know, if the, I can't remember the gradings, but one of them is like um, could do better or something. And so if, if it's not doing as well as you want it to, you, it allows you to, within the app, send a message to that brand going really disappointed to hear that you're you're not as good as you should be or something like that. Um, so that's a really good one. Your 21 year old daughter got you to download the app. It is really good, isn't it? So I downloaded it the other day. I've just jotted down some of the ethical brands um, that, that sort of national that come to my mind. There will be there are lots of really small independent ones that are amazing. So People Tree and Thought have been around for a long time. If you're looking for um, sort of leisure wear and things, Finisterre and Howie's are really good. Mud Jeans have a really interesting concept whereby um, they're European, but they they have this circular model. So you kind of you effectively rent the jeans off them, and then when you no longer want them, you return them, and and they get to use the fabric. They keep the fabric in this loop and in this circle. So that's a really interesting model. And Lucy and Yak um, are a British brand. They do um, some of their clothes are made in Britain. Others, you know, they they are kind of um, know the factories where they're made. So good on you. It's the good on you app, Liz, um, Sarah. Um, so. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're really lovely and they do these lovely dungarees and trousers and things like that. So, um, but yeah, Rapa Nui, they do um, t-shirts and things. They're made on the, I wanna say they're made on the Isle of Wight. Might have just made that up. Um, 
Um, so yeah, if people want to, um, it would be really nice to kind of crowdsource some suggestions and some names for for new things. So, you know, this isn't saying that you can never buy new again. This is never isn't saying that you can never go to Primark again. Like, I understand, especially if you've got teenagers and things like that, or if there's something that you just need for the kids in a hurry and you need to know it's going to be there. There will be occasions when we need to do that, and that is okay. But what I think is really important is that we thought about these decisions first. So we thought. Can I find this secondhand? Is there anyone I can borrow this from for a little bit? Um, you know, can I um, can I can I make this from something I've already got? No. Okay. So, have I got time at the moment to source this ethically? Have I got the budget at the moment to source this ethically? Maybe I haven't at the moment. So, okay. But you know, you've you've made a thoughtful decision. It's not just this kind of. And that was my biggest learning from a year buying nothing new was that. Um, you know, so much of what I was buying was unconscious. It was that, you know, going to Ikea and coming out with all the tea lights and all the other things. It was going into Littles for a pint of milk and coming out with a fence sprayer. It's all those kinds of things that, that we just, you know, oh, and I'd, you know, I'd go and be doing the supermarket shop and I'd just sort of, oh, I'll just have a look around the clothes and oh, the kids would like that and they could do it. Do you know, it was really unthoughtful, unconscious. So, so, I'm not, like I said, I, I'm not saying, God, you know, you're going to be struck down if you ever go into H&M or Primark or anywhere like that again. Um, and, and somebody raised a really interesting point in um, in the face in our Facebook group the other day saying, um, you know, they'd worked in the fast fashion industry and a lot of the um, the factories will will make exactly the same stuff for Primark as they will for M&S, as they will for um, Gap or someone like that. Um, but um, the the end point pricing is different um because of the branding and all that sort of thing so you know it, there isn't necessarily a case of um paying more um gives you that clean conscience it's a case of lo really looking closely at for the brands um that have very um robust very transparent policies and things like that so that sounds you know a real pain in the ass to have to do when you just want to go and get a t-shirt so something like the good on you app is great the other website that's really good to look at is Ethical Consumer. I think it's ethicalconsumer.org. Um, they have um, they have a fashion section on there and they've rated all the brands. Um, so that can be a really, really great place to start as well. Oh, right. I'm really going to try and, oh, that shouldn't be in there, should it? Is that one the wrong way? Okay, everyday activism. I just want to touch on this because as well as making all these changes and these different choices with the things that we're buying, we can actually really make our voice heard as well. So, do you know, like there's um, this whole argument a lot of the time about the climate crisis and is it the responsibility of individuals or businesses or um, the government? And obviously it's all three. OK, we need all three of these layers um, acting. Um, and um, so we can use our voices to put pressure on the brands and to um, to ask the government what they're doing to protect um, garment workers in um, developing nations and things like that. So this, this is another tattoo of I were brave enough. Every time you spend money, you're casting a vote for the kind of world that you want. So we talked about this true cost. We talked about the true cost of clothing, of food. And all these arguments, by the way, apply to everything. They apply to tech. They apply to our mobile phones. They apply to... Um, you know, household goods. Um, somebody asked me earlier, you know, does this apply to, to accessories and, and bags and things like that? Yes, it does. It's all the same. It's all just, you know, churned out in order to keep up with this demand um, that, that we're putting on the world. Um, so, so we can make very, by the money that we spend or we don't spend, you know, so, so by not refreshing our clothes because we're told that there's a new season or this is in fashion or that fashion that's quite powerful um you know by choosing to spend your money with another brand because they have more transparent ethical policies that's really quite powerful and the thing that you can do to then double that or to even to triple it actually is to say um i talk to this I talk to people about this when i talk about switching energy so switching energy supply so for example if you were to switch your energy supply from one of the big six to I don't know, someone like Good Energy, um, you can, uh, you've done that. So you're not giving your money to the fossil fuel people and you're giving your money to the renewables. So you're sending a message to the market that you want more renewables. Um, you're also sending a message to Good Energy that you like what they're doing. You're sending a message to the big six that you don't like it. You can also double that by then emailing them and saying, just wanted to let you know why I've moved. It's because I want my money to be going to support renewable energy and I don't really think that you guys are doing enough. So you've, you've doubled that impact then you can go and share on social media and say, 
hey guys, really exciting. I've just moved my energy supplier um, to good energy um, because of X, Y, and Z. And I've saved some money. And so, do you know, so you could, um, um, you know, not buy something, maybe save up some money and, and instead of um, going, or instead of going and buying 10 items from a fast fashion store, you can just buy a couple of items from a, um, an ethical store. And then you can, you know, you can go online and you can say, oh my God, I've just discovered this amazing new brand. Um, you know, I'm really pleased. Look at the quality of this stuff. It's going to last me for ages, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's, um, you know, there's, there's lots and lots of ways that we can use the power of our, of our voices that don't have to necessarily mean, you know, going on a march and that sort of thing. Um, another quote, you know, we don't have to engage in grand heroic actions to, par to participate in change. So small acts when multiplied by a million can transform the world. And then lovely, amazing Greta, we proved that it does matter what you do. That's what you and I do. And no one is too small to make a difference. Um, so what now? Here's some ideas for some suggestions. I did say this, you know, I was going to kind of invite you to take some action at the end. Could you go on a fast fashion fast? I know that Alessia's already um, suggested that. Uh, I think she has a 200 day, um, uh, you know, buy nothing new. We obviously did, we did a year buying nothing new and that included clothes and actually was much easier than I thought it was going to be. The other thing I then did, I think I then had a sort of year off. And then the year after that, I then did a year buying no clothes at all, whether new or secondhand. And like, I was so bored of it by the end of that. Um, but, you know, you don't have to go to those extremes. Could you say for the next three months, I'm, I'm not going to buy any, any new clothes? Um, could you say, um, I'm not going to buy any fast fashion for the rest of the year? And, um, you know, if I do buy new clothes, then they're only going to be from these retailers. Or could you say actually, before I buy anything, I'm going to check on the Good On You app and I'm going to choose the ones that have the top highest two ranks or something like that. Um, so that's that's one thing that you can do. Um, so Alessia's has got a hashtag 200 days that matter. So I really like that. That's gorgeous. Um, could you commit to sourcing a proportion of your wardrobe secondhand? There's um, a charity, a, a fashion, um, it's not the right word. Uh, yeah, I think I guess they are a fashion charity called Trade, T-R-A-I-D in London. And they do a campaign called Secondhand First, hashtag Secondhand First. So can you commit to sourcing 50% of your wardrobe secondhand, 80% um, of your wardrobe secondhand? Because all this time, it's just making you think a little bit. It's slowing down your consumption. It's slowing down that I need that. I've got it. I've got it here tomorrow. It's on Amazon Prime or whatever. I've got it here tomorrow. Just slow it down a little bit. A really good tactic and, and something that um, Sarah with the Biarchy of Needs does. She wrote a book called A Bunch of Pretty Things I Did Not Buy. And because she's such a gorgeous, beautiful, talented illustrator, when she wanted something like a dress or a pair of shoes or and she drew it rather than bought it. And I do a similar thing kind of with the kids in that when, you know, if we're in the shop and they're about to have a complete meltdown because they want something, I say, well, look, let's take a picture of it on my phone. <clears throat> and if you still want it, in a week's time and you remember that it's on my phone then we can have a think about where we might be able to get it from and I think that's really like that's something that we can do as well so you know if you're bored and you're shopping or you're browsing online put it in your basket and if you still remember it's in your basket in a week's time okay have a think about it the other really important thing you can do a really useful easy thing you can do is unsubscribe unsubscribe from all those brands that you're subscribed to that are constantly sending you emails telling you I mean I was on um thoughts email list and um people tree i think and i've just unsubscribed because i was just getting these emails telling me every time they had a sale on which seemed really really regularly um and going oh well, i'll just go and have a look but i didn't really need anything and if i do need anything i don't i know where the website is so i can go and have a look and um, so that's a really nice easy thing to do and then you know post lockdown can you have a swish with your friends um how can you keep your clothes in use for longer if you've got something that you're like mm, or do you know has it can it be mended if you've got three things in your mending pile you can mend i would really love um you know to hear if there's we do need more than an hour helen if there's something um you know really concrete that's going to come out of this for you so do one thing imagine if eight billion people believed that what they did they could make a difference imagine if everybody here today we've got we've had 100 people live on the call um 200 people I think signed up for it so if everybody did one thing and if everybody did one thing and then um 
amplified that by sharing it on social media, like using some of these um, hashtags like Alessia's done, you know, if you decide you're not going to buy anything new until the end of the year, my God, share that on social media, tell people what you're doing, tell people you came to this webinar, invite them to watch the replay, tell them some of the stats that I've shared, like, because I think a lot of people, I was like this before our, before our year buying nothing new, I kind of knew that fast fashion wasn't that great, but I somehow chose to look away from it. I chose, I, I, genuinely thought if you'd asked me I thought that clothes would have been made clothes were being made in a factory and it was all automated and all done by machines and and then I discovered clothes are being made in a factory but they're being you know they're being made by this succession of women just sat there sewing one single seam that's all they do they do the same seam there is no you know um so and they're doing that for 12 14 18 hours a day um you know I didn't I didn't really know that that was happening and that's okay if you didn't know that that was happening because you can't change what you don't know about so there's no guilt or anything around that um and I also assumed that you know if, if these clothes are being sold for that cheaper price then it was okay because somebody surely surely somebody somewhere is looking after these people surely they won't be allowed to do it if it's causing all this damage or if it's really that bad for people um and and sadly nobody is all they're looking out for is their um their bottom line and their profits. Um, Fiona, this is gorgeous. I'm a climate ambassador, so I'll devise a model to deliver to our WIs. That is so amazing. Helen's going to download the Good On You app and get her daughter to try the same. She's going to try 100 days and then 200 days buying nothing new. Gemma's already downloaded the Good On You app. Uh, take a picture of your stuff, trying stuff on and go away. Again, often you'll realize it wasn't that great after all. Um, you know, now we're not allowed to try stuff on as well. So I think um, a bag that I've been putting on wanted clothes in and ready for us for a swish. Amazing. Um, yeah, Diz mentioned this stat from Patrick Grant on the saying, be there's currently enough clothing in the world to clothe the next six generations. Like this is this is some crazy stuff. Um, so let me have a quick look at the questions. Claire, how can we collaborate to add this information to the school curriculum to educate the next generation? Kids must be educated to understand their purchasing choices. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know, but I think that's a really lovely question to put out to everybody. I know that Fashion Revolution, I've mentioned them a few times. It's where I got a lot of the stats from. Um, I think they're fashionrevolution.org. Um, they're a charity that was set up after the Rana Plaza factory collapse. Um, and do an awful lot of education around um, fast fashion and the impact of the fashion industry. Um, they have an awful lot of resources on their website. They have free resources. They have a PowerPoint for six to 11 year olds. They have a PowerPoint for secondary school children. There is loads and loads of um, you know, resources there. Yeah, it'd be a really great assembly topic, wouldn't it? And I think in the same way that um, you know, kids really easily grasp plastic, I think they'd really easily, and kids have this really, um, almost innate sense of fairness as well if you were to say to them look do you, do you think it's right that a child might have made your clothes or do you think it's right that someone's mum has to leave them at home while they go and work in this factory like they would say no and and you know and then I think they start then putting the pressure on their parents to come up with some different choices and things so I think that's really um really lovely um so yeah fashion revolution has got loads of resources um eco schools um do a lot of work with schools I don't know if they have a fashion module um but you know I'm sure if you got in touch with them it's something that, that they would be be happy to come up with so eco schools I can't remember the website off the top of my head um but they do an awful lot of education around this there's oh I found it yesterday on Twitter there's a brilliant app uh, it's not an app it's a website um run by teenagers for teenagers at schools to get them to help them to organize swishes at schools um oh, might be called time to swap on twitter if anyone's on twitter but there's there, you know there is stuff going on as you say claire maybe it needs that kind of collaborative um uh thing is bamboo any better than cotton um yes it is i think is probably the the short answer um, bamboo is a really really fast growing plant it needs much less water and much less pesticides that's not grammatically correct is it fewer pesticides less water than cotton um than, than conventionally farmed cotton the problem is bamboo like we've got bamboo plant in our garden it's hard isn't it it's and so how do we get that bamboo from being this hard rigid wood to being this nice soft silky um material and the answer is that a lot of the time that's done with really really harsh chemicals um and oh, i have to look it up in the book because i always get this the wrong way around um 
there's there's one um, process that is much, much kinder because they use this closed loop process so that all the chemicals and all the water stay within the loop and are recycled and used again, rather than um, what happens conventionally with bamboo um, is that, um, you know, all these chemicals are just poured out straight into the um, into the water system. Um, so yeah, so the closed loop ones, so look out for um, tensile, T-E-N-C-E-L, which is made from sustainably sourced eucalyptus pulp. Um, and um, and there's one called lyocell, which is made from, yeah, lyocell is made from wood pulp and it has this circular system um, and so does tensile. So if you are looking for um, sort of bamboo based ones, look for those, okay, so T-E-N-C-E-L, tensile and lyocell, L-Y-O-C-E-L-L. -L. Um, linen is another really good choice um, because it's, um, you know, it grows really well, doesn't need the same amount of chemicals and things like that. How do we affect change with the bigger companies? Hopefully I've covered that a little bit in that kind of activism thing. So again, have a look at Fashion Revolution. Every April they do this big campaign and it's called, they have this hashtag, who made my clothes? Um, and the invitation is that you, um, so yeah, they do still use chemicals, Wendy, but they're, they're, they're much less chemically intensive because they're keeping them within these loop and reusing them. Um, so the, the hashtag is who made my clothes. And the idea is that you will uh, um, either wear a garment inside out or take a picture of the label of a garment and, um, and then tweet or ask on social media, tag the brand in social media and say, hey, um, uh, Bowden, who made my clothes? Um, hashtag who made my clothes? Um, and um, the, you know, and then some some of the companies will reply and will say, oh, these are our policies. But the vast majority of companies obviously don't. They don't want to engage around this particularly. But, you know, continually putting this pressure on them, that kind of thing um, can be really, really helpful. So, yeah, as Lucy said, don't buy from them and explain why you don't to your friends. Um, you know, so so it is a lot. You know, you can um, you can just that is one of the powers of social media is you can you know you don't even need to wait for Fashion Revolution Month in October in, in April. You can you can you know you can ask them questions all the time. Just ask them questions. Say, oh, you know, that's not really very clear or transparent on your website. Can you perhaps explain that to be a little bit more? Um, and they might not want to. Um, but you know, and especially if you're doing that on social media in a public forum, I think the pressure becomes on them to um, to sort of um, you know, if enough people are asking them, um, you know, that's why H&M and Zara, I think, have brought out, um, you know, eco-friendly ranges because they're seeing that, pe that the money is moving. They will follow the money. So they're seeing that, the, that there is this growing awareness around fast fashion, around the impact of fashion on the planet. And they're seeing that more and more people are making different choices. So they want a piece of that market. So it really, really does um, have an impact. Can the government make retailers more accountable to the waste and the impact that fast fashion has? Oh, I don't know. In I guess in the same way that we're looking at, um, or allegedly, um, DEFRA, we're looking at, you know, a plastic tax and things like that. So that, um, you know, that this, um, that, you know, ideally what we want is the, 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 companies producing the plastic to then be responsible for clearing up that plastic and recycling that plastic and things like that. Um, uh, you know, I guess ideally what we want is is that same thing to be happening in the in the textile industry, that everybody has um, a responsibility, that the retailers have this responsibility to, to get this fabric back again and that we're aiming for this circular economy. Um, there's a brilliant brand called, um, where does it come from? Um, I don't know if I don't think Joe is on this call, but she's amazing. And when you buy, they do um, shirts and scarves, gorgeous scarves, and they do kids trousers. And um, on the trousers is a, is a is a code, and you can go to the website and you can type in the code, and it will tell you who grew the cotton, where the cotton was grown, where the fabric was weaved, who sewed the garment. Like it, so, do you know if a if a little brand like that can do it? Um, and Joe's had this idea and she's made it happen. If a little brand like that can do it, I don't understand why these other brands can't do it. So, you know, if Joe can get that traceability literally from, you know, cotton seed to end garment. Um, so there, she's where does it come from? And again, I can't remember if it's um, dot, I think it's probably dot co dot UK. 
Um, Alessia says, no, the government refused to introduce these changes last year in June or July. So again, if there are bills coming up in Parliament that you hear about, one of the really powerful things you can do is get in touch because campaigning around a specific issue to MPs is, is more important than generally right is more powerful maybe than gen than writing to them saying what are you doing about fast fashion so if you know that there's a bill coming up around fashion then getting in touch with your MP whether you tweet them whether you send them a message on Facebook whether you write to them whether you email them saying there's this bill coming up really want to know how you're going to vote on that because for these reasons you know did you know and share some stats with them would really be interested in having a chat with you about this because you know MPs want to stay in in a job so if, if enough of their um brilliant thank you Helen where does it come from .co.uk if enough of their constituents are getting in touch to say this is an issue that they're concerned about they will start to change the way that they're voting what are better materials to look out for when buying clothes so um Natural fibres are great, Emma. So, um, you know, so trying to avoid those synthetic fabrics if you can, it can be really, really difficult. Um, looking for organic and fair trade versions, um, certainly of cotton um, is really, you know, because as I said, cotton um, is very water and resource um, hungry. If we're, you know, if we're buying organic and fair trade, um, generally, um, I guessing it's not always the case, but generally the, the people will have been um, paid. Um, linen is very good. Hemp is actually really, really good, really eco-friendly. Um, needs to lose its kind of, um, I guess, sort of hippie um, uh, marijuana type connotations. But hemp is really, really good, really eco-friendly. Um, so, yeah, linen is good. Um, organic or fair trade cotton, hemp. They're the really big ones, I think. Sue says yes. Sorry, Sue. <laughs> um, as the organiser, what would you do with any unwanted clothes left at the end? Um, so um, this is um, talking about swishes, I'm guessing. If you're doing it for a charity, Helen says the charity will usually take it and put it in their shop or rag it. Um, be really clear about what you will take and what you won't take. Be really clear about the quality of clothes that need to be in there so that, you know, you're not getting people just putting in like dirty, smelly, broken stuff. Um, and then if you've got stuff at the end, what I've tended to do is like cherry pick the best bit so that I've got a little stash for starting up the next one so that there's some clothes already there when I next run one. Um, and then, yeah, um, it probably is a case of donating it um, to a charity shop. Um, and just yeah, and it, it is really difficult, but because I've just said, you know, don't overwhelm the charity shops, don't swamp the charity shops. But actually, if you've passed on half of that half of all these stuff that would otherwise have gone to a charity shop and you've diverted half of it to people who are actively going to keep it in use that's really really good so don't feel too guilty about um sort of handing stuff over to the charity shop are there any charity shop that gives clothes to people in need i don't know elodie that's a really good question there are organizations that will do things like um take suits and um give them to homeless people going to have job interviews there are obviously um, organisations that will donate to women's refuges and things like that. There are some organisations that will um, take close to refugees and things like that. So I, I don't know of any specifically off the top of my head, but um, some people in the chat might do. Um, what did you allow yourself to buy in your no spend year? What were your rules? Um, Shauna, we, um, we said we could buy um, food because I was really, I cannot be self-sufficient in food. I'm so ungreen fingered. Uh, medicines and toiletries, although I, I don't think, um, I ended up making my own deodorant and don't use masses of toiletries otherwise. Um, and we said we could buy underwear. Although again, actually, I don't think I did for the year. I just made do with these really manky nursing bras that I had. <laughs> and then at the end of the year, it was like the first thing I wanted to go out and get was some new bras. Um, so underwear. Um, and we also said the kids were really little and I was really aware that um, I didn't want sort of my crazy project to, to wreck their feet. So I said that we could buy new shoes for them so that we knew that they fitted properly. So those were our rules. We also said if anything broke um, and we needed to buy a new part to fix it, that made much more sense than obviously like ditching something and trying to find a new one secondhand. Um, so, yeah, I think that is all the questions. We've gone slightly over the hour. Thank you so much for um, sticking with me. Loving all this chat. Um, Tamsin says, Grace in the southeast of London for refugees if you're nearby. That doesn't quite make sense, Tamsin. I don't know if there's, a, if there's somebody that you know or a, an organisation. So, yeah, um, call out again for can can you let us know about upcoming bills I don't know if there is a way Effie of um 
you know, keeping track of that. There's a website called They Work For You, which is how you can find out who your MP is and how they voted, and whether that will let you know what upcoming bills are. Um, organisations like Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, probably Fashion Revolution are good ones to, to go and to check their websites because they probably are, you know, there are these, they are these big campaigning bodies who get behind these bills and um, really put pressure on, to, um, on MPs to, to get them voting the right way. Um, traceability is more complex, yeah, for huge companies that buy from suppliers. Um, Carol's making that point. So that's what we were saying about, you know, it's really difficult for them to actually be sure where they get their, you know, what their supply chains are and all that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, loving that lots of people are, are going to do a, um, a sort of um, no buy for 100 days or 200 days. Oh, OK. Um, Sarah says eco schools don't look at fashion. She's trained as an assessor. Um, so that's a shame. Maybe that's something that, you know, we could ask them um, to include. Uh, Ten-year-old was on the eco school council. Says yes, they do do a lot about clothing choices in the environment. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's that's really interesting. I don't. Um, I'll have to have a look on the eco schools website and have a look. Our free shop Friday has a regular school uniform swap. Brilliant, amazing. Um, so yeah. Um, thank you guys, everybody, for coming. Like I said, the replay will be available if you want to have another listen or have another look. Um really great point here by Denise you know the, the solution is to buy less that quote by um Vivian Westwood buy less buy better do you know it kind of does come down to as simple as that do you know like if if we all bought I don't know a third less or something like that then um do you know can you imagine what the impact um would be so yeah let's let's all choose to elect to do you know even if you don't want to not buy clothes for x amount of time um can you say, well, I'm only going to buy X number of items for the rest of this year. I'm going to allow myself five new purchases, 10 new purchases for the rest of this year. Um, and then so I'm going to have to think really carefully about what those ones are so that I can um, I can make sure they're the ones that I need. So, yeah, thank you, guys. Please do think about that, that action that you want to take. Um, you know, if you want to go and if you want to share that on social media, that would be amazing. If you want to. Is there another? I've got a slide with my social media yeah so you know if you if you want to come and on social media and and tag me or anything like that if you want to use the hashtag sustainable-ish share the change that you're taking this is this is the thing that drives me this is why I do these things so that I can you know so that we can get people taking action so you know please do go and share that you've watched the webinar point people to the replay which will be available on this same link um share the actions that you're going to take come into it come into the Facebook group come and tag me on Twitter or Instagram anything like that so um yeah please do do that let's create a little some ripples from this evening um you know we've dropped that that pebble into the pond oh Tamsin you're watching with your nine-year-old daughter thank you um so Adeline the replay will be available on this link so literally as soon as I press end it will literally take a few minutes and it will be available again um active and fitness wear yeah um secondhand cycling shorts um so um Howie's Finisterre places like that they do a lot of um uh, sort of active wear. Um, Georgina at Pebble Magazine, she's got some great resources, I think, around ethical fashion and some really great ethical brands. So have a little look at that. I think she might even have a blog post on um, active and fitness wear, Zara. So have a look. That's pebblemag.com. Um, buy better and buy and buy quality, buy better, buy less, buy better quality, keep for longer. Um, brilliant. Continuing not to buy new. Well done, Rosalind. So thank you, guys. I've got to go and walk the dog because it looks like it might have finally stopped raining. Rerun. Oh, I love Rerun. I really want to get them on the podcast, sell secondhand running gear. All those finisher t-shirts and things that you get that, that never get used, they make really good use of them. So that's amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sticking with me when I've gone over time. Thank you for all your amazing chat and comments and actions. Like I said, let's now get out there on social media and kind of share this and um, see what ripples we can create. Thank you so much and uh, see you all soon. Take care.